good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Happy Earth Day. Stay hydrated like a tree. Nourish yourself with some H2O. This is going to be an interesting conversation about the wisdom of trees and tree yoga. So thank you for joining in and listening. Uh, let me just... I'm waiting for my guests to join. We have Dimitri Glasgow, who I went on a retreat with um, last year in the immersive, beautiful nature of Hardwick Estate. Hi, Dima. Welcome. Hi. Hi. I was just like chatting that. about our retreat in Hardwick Estate last year and the complete immersive nature of the retreat including the water element, the earth element, the tree element, the food. It was um, all rounded. We're so excited to bring it back, the community. It's, it's that aspect. Is, uh, you miss for the winter to come together with people and just sit around the fire yeah. and meet all the friends again. And Yeah, so next week we're going to be all back on the land i was yesterday passing on the boat that land and so oh, next week is going to be full of people that'll be wonderful <laughs> hi yannick welcome hello good morning hi. hello nice to see you so yannick is also going to be part of this retreat and um yannick is a shamanic artist, workshop leader with a special focus on tree wisdom. And it's nice to see that you are immersed in that wisdom in nature. <laughs> yes, thank you for the introduction. Yeah, I look forward to our conversation. Yannick, while we're, able, while we're waiting for Fred, could you please tell us a little bit about your nature-based spirituality and shamanic initiation from an early age? Yeah, so just um, briefly, what happened for me is that um, as a teenager, I was in a boarding school. I was uh, in a specialized school for forestry. Mm. And... Um, Every afternoon after the school classes, I would just go out by myself into the woods. Our boarding school was surrounded by forests. And, um, yeah. Um, <clears throat> hello, Fred. <laughs> welcome, welcome. And so, um, so, I spent a lot of time by myself in nature. And uh, I didn't know I was communicating with the trees. I just had a sensitivity towards listening to the different trees energies and it's only much later that i gain like the um, uh, rational or intellectual understanding that there's other people who are communicating with trees so for me it was very much like a an intuitive thing that started early on in my life and that later on um became more clear as i met other people who are yeah following those same kind of lines of inspiration. Yannick, you say you um, are a specialist in tree wisdom. <laughs> so can you talk a bit more about the wisdom you have gained from trees? Yeah, so it's very much an ongoing quest. And for me, what's astonishing, trees seem to be able to interact with our energy field and our emotions and our mind in ways that are very relevant um, to life. So one of the things I find is, just to give you an example, is I find trees are very generous in their, in their energy and in the way that they share their, their fruits and their leaves and their, um, yeah, the way that they are in the space. And that's one of the things by spending time with trees and tuning into them, which I naturally feel a sense of, uh, generosity emerging from them. Another example would be acceptance because a tree only grows in one place and it always does the best that it can in that particular place. So if I get into a, of a mindset where I think I'm not in the right circumstances, this is challenging or something, and then I look at a tree that's growing in the wind and that's been exposed to strong winds for like 
50 years and it's all growing sideways and it's twisted, but it's still strong and vibrant and it is just doing the best that it can. And so these are like the kind of lessons that I mean by tree wisdom. And yeah, it's an ongoing thing mm -hmm. that no one can actually hold in totality but that's like an ongoing conversation thank you for those two yeah. points and i'd like to also introduce fred hagendahl and fred you can you please share with us why you were interested in the history of trees and you've been interested for over 20 years i believe and also written a few books uh, about the meaning of trees so can you please share your history and How yes, did you get to this moment? it was more like 40 years or so. I think my tree journey began because I grew up in the 60s and 70s when the world here in Europe was really much more obviously polluted than we see it now. That was before globalism took all the dirt over to China and India and in other countries. So I, I never seen a fox, I never seen a swimming fish in the polluted rivers and so on. So trees were the only things I really had of nature. And then when I was 18, I had a dream, a visionary dream, where I saw the spirits of tree species floating away from Earth and they were leaving our planet and I was kneeling on the ground screaming don't leave us don't leave us and they were so sad looking and they said we have to go we have to go and since then i know that we were in the age of extinction and that many of these trees would go and so deforestation and the destruction of the planet has always been on my shoulders and so what can we do to prevent that to to fight for life to fight for nature And trees are strong allies, despite the threat. Uh, and everything, anything that threats trees also threats humans and vice versa. So, and Yannick is totally right. Trees teach us so much in their botany, but also in their history. Mm. And we can also learn from how ancient people all over the world have um, responded to trees. Not just in the practical way, of course, gathering fruits and building materials but also in the spiritual sense. So my quest of research began really, well, I came from the heart and from experience, but I also became a bit of a heady person, like researching and finding what's really there, what was there, because that's what trees taught me, is you know the notion that trees can only grow as high as their roots go down. It's not quite like that in botany, but as a metaphor it is. So that means we can go high and excited uh, in our connections and our dancing and celebration of nature, but we have to root ourselves. And that rooting in, in, in modern times, also with the new age and all flimsy ideas floating around, floating around, is the rooting for me is also rooting in knowledge. So whenever I had a vision or a feeling of a tree and what they bring, I would like to, then I would go back and research history, the ancient Celts, the ancient Egyptians even. Every culture on earth had sacred trees and assigned associations with them. And then mm. you find they're often the same. People uh, like, in, there's just, yeah, divided by millennia and around the globe, people had the same responses and the same ideas about certain tree species. Thank you. Okay, for... I'll stop now before I go on and on. And um, back to Yannick with your modern duetry immersion experience. Can you share um, how that relates to um, trees? The way I look at modern druidry, it's like um, a language, uh, a language for nature connection and particularly like the spiritual side of nature connection. So It's like a, a collection of tools and ideas that uh, don't all come, go back to um, the Celtic times because a lot has been lost. So it has to be reinvented through the stories that we have, like from Welsh mythology, from Irish mythology, but also archaeology. And so what we find very predominantly is that the worship um, of trees and the connection of tree wisdom especially in the European indigenous cultures. Uh, when we were Christianized, 
a lot of the sacred groves were cut down, but originally our ancestors would have celebrated seasonal festivals and met for like, significant uh, moments in, in natural places, in places in nature. So for me, this all um, interlinks. It's not just like a nice uh, kind of background picture. It's actually our temple. So nature, as I see it, is, is the temple and also the sacred book. So instead of having um, one book where the truth is kind of written in words, uh, each one of us is reading the book of nature and listening to the book of nature. And in that, we all have our own individual transmission of that knowledge. So that's the oral tradition where there's more than one truth. And as we share our truth, we're all learning from each other and we're all learning from nature. Thank you. And the trees are particularly important. Yeah. Thank you. I'll leave it there um, for now. Dima, Dima, what, do you have anything to add in comparison to Duodri to your relationship and understanding with the history of trees and also what drives you to share this knowledge with everyone by running these retreats and immersion retreats on Hardwick Estate? I, I connect with that through more seeing the roots of it all throughout the whole cultures. So I see the connection between the whole cultures around the world and particularly the Vedic Brahmins. There is also a, a big influence in uh, Slavic tradition of the those people who were connected to trees. And there is uh, one of the particular thing which was... Uh, responsibility of the Slavic priest in a way it was it was when the kid was born in in a village then the this uh, priest or, or Brahmin sort of the knowledgeable man like a druid in a way the druid means uh, one with wisdom of the tree or like knowledgeable uh, person so he noticed what precisely moment the baby was born and would go and find the particular tree in the forest and they would uh, take some part of it or make a ceremony to cut it down and make a log out of it and give it to the father of the of the person and that uh, father would make all the details which the baby would need throughout the whole life like a spoon like uh, his uh, little carrier like little cupboard and stuff like that so that tree would support that person throughout the whole whole life which is mostly to do with the supportive connection of each other so they with that knowledge we can actually gain support from it and gain that inner wisdom because you know trees are embody the stillness and that's the main uh, yoga definition right the yoga is the calming the fluctuation of the minds chitta vrita nirodhi in uh, patanjali yoga sutras and trees in a way is the best yogi so <laughs> which is actually embodied that state this knowledge is there and they are massive help to uh, people on their path and i feel this is really important now to get it out there and get people connected to to what is available it's like a doping to people without having attachment <laughs> or so yeah yes, that's, this i like is that the... point it is natural doping <laughs> can get high off a tree and high figuratively and um chemically <laughs> That's right. Well, this this is the 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 trees, the doping for the yogi, and for me it was a practical aspect because when the lockdown hit, I went to the tree and I experienced that connection. Since then, I've been just driven uh, with that connection, and I feel that there was a there was a communication there and it was a ask to me from that oak tree go and share this now you mm -hmm. you you have the responsibility to bring it to people now and mm -hmm. since then it was flowing really so i just uh, mm -hmm. you know start sharing it and it's it's been supportive so ever so 
Thank you. And Fred, do you have anything to add to the show? Yeah, I just thought this is so typically oak tree. It gives us energy and spirit and we do it. And uh, what Dima just described about these Slavic traditions is beautiful and also links into what I said before, that the traditions of linking a human life with a tree is, again, it's like a global thing that the ancient Romans planted a tree for the birth of a child and uh, they got it from the ancient Greeks. In some traditions, people would um, bury the placenta or the uh, navel cord with it or under the tree, I mean, when they plant the tree and things like that. So again, the connection between life, human life and tree is been omnipresent in human history and mm. until capitalism cut the cord. Uh, Yannick, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, just a few little uh, thoughts around. Uh, we speak of the um, ancestral tree as well. People are into ancestry, researching their ancestors were often uh, depicted as a tree. Mm. And I like this image, uh, humanity as a tree as well where each one of us is like a, a leaf and a crown of one big tree but then we can expand that into other species as well where we touch on that world tree image that stretches across different dimensions and that's where we can even if we, if we are on one branch somewhere we are still in the same uh, being that's uh, other dimensions that are across different places of that uh, um uh, yeah, vibrant symbol that has been recognized across uh, many different cultures. And yeah, yeah. that's Thank me. You. And Dima, you run these yoga retreats with Amongst the Trees. So can you explain what is tree yoga? Yeah, so as I started, I think for me is the, is the root of the yoga, is the original yoga in, in a sense of the how Patanjali would put it, and and this is about the seeing beyond the mind uh, illusion, right? Who we are and who we, uh, you know, what people expect us, who we are, how we seen, and in order to see be you, the nature be of yourself beyond that, you you want to calm your mind, right? You want to calm those uh, conditions, and that's the one of the main quality of the trees they they have that within themselves but the second uh, aspect so there's two aspects is this stillness aspect of the trees which we can tap into and communicate and use but there's a, another aspect of it where the tree has the upward movement of the energy from its roots towards the crown so it's a constant movement it's a slow but it's a constant movement of the sap under its uh, bark so moving upwards and it's mimic the same what is happening in our body in our spine like the kundalini energy you can relate to this because that's the whole yoga systems was uh, built around this movement of the energy into the higher states right through the spine and upward so when the person is sitting under the tree and meditating or doing some certain kriyas or certain body locks for example pulling the energy up mm -hmm. the tree helping that to move along because that you you tapping into that flow generally so this is second aspect and the third aspect which i found very interesting to work with fred for example because they have um, been working on this before understanding the qualities of each tree each tree has its own character it's like a human being and it's on strong points and we can tap into it by uh, matching when you have the knowledge of the qualities of the trees and knowledge of the careers and the exercises and the certain sets then you can match those two qualities for example if you need to develop endurance and leadership you could work with certain uh, qualities of the oak tree and you can do perform certain exercises under it to enhance it you have a two du double double powers there you're not just doing it developing through the exercise but you're also tapping into the power of that presence of that qualities around you or you are under so bringing those two together 
giving us an advancement and is just speeding up our development in yoga and generally development to ourselves and our qualities. We can mm. shape our personality accordingly. It's like a bodybuilding, but it's more like a mind building and a human be- building, like a human design in a way. Mm. Uh, thank you, Fred. Do you have anything to add to that? About yeah, true add yoga? To I have something to say about the oak tree. When Dima says, yes, the oak tree is among one of the aspects he mentioned leadership, that links in with the common notion of the oak tree, that it is a very strong, very male endurance tree. And that notion has been going on in the West for centuries, like uh, in the time of when the British built the empire, they said our, our um, the navy and the people on the sailors our what did they say ships uh, hearts of oak were our ships or something like that they actually eraded whole oak forests not in their own country but their territories like ireland to build these fleets to to subdue the world and uh, so there's a strong notion also anthroposophic science has actually shown the oak is uh, under the influence of planet Mars, which then in astrology is like the warrior and so on. So there's this, all this notion about uh, strength in a kind of very male patriarchal sense about the oak tree. But when you look deeper, and that's the beauty of researching, you find quite the opposite. It's not all young at all. Oak is the most paternal, if you like, even motherly tree of all our European tree species. There are more species of insects, uh, spiders and uh, mammals and birds living, using the oak as a habitat. And even with Mars, that is uh, planet Mars or the god Mars started in ancient Rome as the protector of the fields. So he's like a, like a mother bear rather. The original Mars is like protecting the community, protecting nature and all of that. So from that deep feminine power, that deep yin power comes the strength for endurance and leadership, if you like, but it's not a patriarchal leadership like the general in the army. Mm. That's my point. May I ask like on that, because the tree roots, they can be intertwined and exchange their energies with each other. So by if you don't have the luxury of having all the trees that you need to tap into around you, can you just meditate or do a yoga practice under one tree and still Absolutely. get the benefits from the others, uh, the Absolutely. qualities of the other through that tree communicating. Yes, because for one, everything in life is interconnected. And even within the character of one tree species, say there is everything in it. We just highlight the, the most prevalent powers. Like I just said, Oak is connected to the planet Mars, so the real life planet. That's true. But of course, all the other planets have an influence too. So mm. it's it's all there. And uh, why could Buddha find enlightenment under the Bodhi tree? Because everything is in the world tree. The world tree is the world, is the universe. And every single tree, every even every small plant, every seedling is a, a, you know, a little manifestation of that world tree. So are we with our internal tree column along the spine and that would bring us back to kundalini yoga thank you and yannick do you have anything to add yes most definitely but yeah just to speak to um this kind of idea of the trees having different qualities the way i see it is that let's say in like different mythologies there's this idea of a pantheon so we have like the different archetypes and the father god and the mother god and then there's tricksters and there's all kinds of characters and for me the trees are like an embodied pantheon of different archetypes and qualities but with the advantage that we can actually go and see them physically put our hands on the bark and actually experience those qualities ourselves mm. and uh, spend the last three years tuning into one tree at a time, spending two to three months just with one particular tree to make sure that I receive that particular signature as it wants to show itself to me individually in that moment and then cross-reference cross with other people's experience. So I then get the flavor of that particular archetype's energy 
And then I've um, been transmitting those through visual artwork and uh, online workshops. And that's been one of my focus. I find that um, uh, that's also going to weave into the retreat. And that's uh, something I find is very special about, uh, because you get a whole set of archetypes where, depending on like, where we feel drawn to, uh, well, where we're at individually, if we're more in like, um, uh, this kind of state or that kind of state, people might feel drawn to certain tree energies. And it's like a whole library of energy that's growing and living around us. Mm. And Yannick, how do you connect to a tree? There's quite a few different ways, but um, I always like to start from the physical and then to go into more of the subtle and the energetic. So I usually start off by visiting some of the oldest trees, visiting trees that have naturally grown, that have not been planted by humans, and finding like unique like, like characters. If I want to learn from someone, I seek out those kind of old characters and I quest for them for several weeks and I just walk and find them and then I spend time and it's a lot about dropping expectations actually it's a lot about dropping preconceived ideas and I try and not to read anything before I go and sit a tree with the trees and then do my research later on but really just to get into a place of stillness like Dima was describing this kind of meditative state and in in that slowing down and in that stillness I like to write, I like to draw, I like to make sounds, make movements. And it's a very emergent uh, process, so I don't limit it in advance. I just try and like, remain open. Um, but there's a whole set of tools that um, can be passed on and they're very helpful. Yannick, um, can you share on this retreat what your focus is on sharing in relation to trees? What you will be sharing from your experiences? <laughs> Or teaching? I'll be bringing in some of the creative aspects of connecting with the trees through drawing, writing. I'll bring in some storytelling. And um, because we are blessed to have Fred in our team who brings all the scientific background and the research and all this kind of wealth of knowledge, um, my intention is to just complement um, what he brings um, through yeah, my own individual creative approach and yeah i'll also bring um my artwork and yeah storytelling weaving in with ceremony and other aspects so yeah is that uh your own story that you from your personal history or will you be sharing actually i will be sharing from um mythological like mythological um themes connected with trees yeah. yeah i like to bring in this kind of ancestral um, link there as well um, it's a yeah. special uh time of the year that you're doing this retreat so you'll be sharing this um a special festival um, can you share that significance with us in the wheel of the year as we go through um through the cycle of the four seasons we are coming up to the celebration of beltane which has uh, long been connected with the blossoming of the hawthorn and that kind of reawakening of the, of the green, fertile, vibrant, flowering aspects of life. So these are some of the qualities that we will invite. And um, yeah, I'm sure Fred and Dima will, will be able to elaborate on that a bit Thank more. Thank you, Yannick. Yes, Dima, can you share the spring celebration, <laughs> the auspicious time? Um, I think there's just a special time when the earth is awakened and the uh, potent energy are out there. And this is something to mimic and again, awaken within us. This is something to you know, enhance and bring that courage, uh, which is already out there in a the world. And this was the main thing about the celebrations and the rituals uh, around the most, most of the cultures is that you bring that balance with the with the elements into your world into your body because you can be balancing yourself within but then at some point um, you also 
meet external elements when we you know come to the earth and ground ourselves with the looking barefoot for example this is the grounding or swimming in the river where we uh, bring bring in balance water element and then we jump over the fire for example doing a bonfire a massive bonfire which we actually yeah. gonna be doing this time we have a massive pile of wood which was uh, trimmed and left for us in the field so we're gonna have a massive um, bonfire jumping or walking on the hot coals this is balancing the element of fire within you chanting together it's balancing the ether element and then um, air element we work with the breath control like pranayamas those elements need to be balanced within and also externally and this is when our happiness and that attunement come through and that's where we the, the most feel connected and feel more joyful because when you are in harmony with the surrounding and within as well, then then this sense of contentment come through. And contentment is the key to happiness. When you content, you happy. So and this contentment is has some degree of uh, you know re- relevance to to our connection to external connection and having enough. And that's the root behind the celebration of the past, ba- balancing elements within us. And that is the ultimate yoga is union and union within oneself, but also with the earth and our surroundings. Fred, do you have anything to add? To yes. The- yeah. Regarding Beltane and the seasons, I would like to say, so that Beltane is one of the four Celtic uh, earth festivals of the year. And, uh, you know, while, from the outside in our society, this kind of thing is called, yeah, yeah, neo-pagans call this mm, and talk about earth festivals instead of Christmas and Easter. But uh, I worked with a, a man who did uh, scientific research on the electro, uh, electric um, currents in plants for various forestry commissions around the world. So he measured the electric potentials of plants there, that is their vitality, their activity, mm. and produced you know, masses of data. And what he found is that now from Beltane, or obviously from spring already in March, April on, uh, the energy, energies in nature's rise, obviously, no one's sto- astonished about that. But interestingly, they rise and rise all through the summer and they peak on the 1st of August. And then it goes down again towards the winter. So it's this time when everything is at its low point. So that's the annual cycle. The interesting thing is that on that very peak that is now measured by science on, uh, at the, around, you know, with one, two days, but on the 1st of August, that is actually the Celtic summer festival of Lunasa. So you see that the ancients with very uh, intuit by very intuitive means and being at one with nature, yeah, mm-hmm. worked, actually it worked for them. They managed to be at one with nature and, and live a life accordingly, unlike us. Thank you for sharing about that, celebrating the change of seasons and the traditions, which is such an element that is lost, I believe, in modern society that is losing itself. And thank you for reigniting that flame. And um, Fred, you know, do you think we can resuscitate Mother Nature in, in the sense of the critical point that we are in this moment? Mm. Do you think it's possible to bring back to... Well, I'm I'm glad you bring up this question because that's the crucial one for all of us. Uh, Yes, we have driven the planet and its life support systems to a very dangerous low point. And and some people have given up hope, but that's actually the last thing we can do. We are not allowed to give up hope because then there is really no more hope. And in fact, there are many, many positive signs. We also see how quickly nature can regenerate once you let it. I, I follow Zach Bush, for example, a man who works in, a doctor works in health, but also soil health. And he found that uh, soils that have been poisoned over decades by glyphosate and, and, and pesticides, etc., cetera, are now almost dead in their microbial life that they can recover within a year or two to a very high degree and henceforward even more. So 
uh, nature. And as we've seen in the first lockdowns, how quickly we had dolphins on the coast and birds in the cities and everything. But I mean, that's the surface only. But yes, nature has tremendous potential to heal itself. But what we need to heal first is our mind mm. uh, collectively. And that's actually the most important point I would like to make today. And it's the one I try to make all the time, which is what's really, really bottom line wrong with us as a human species is that we've gone completely anthropocentrical in our thinking. Anthropocentric means putting the human at the center, right? Mm -hmm. Everything has to serve us. And we've been following that uh, trajectory for thousands of years actually but it gets worse and worse since the middle ages and worse and worse since the world wars and now here we are still wanting to extract everything we can possibly extract from nature in terms of resources and uh, the ideas of uh, eternal um, economic growth that everything has to be sacrificed for that that is what we have to change to a form of ecocentrism where we actually put nature first and see our humble role in this beautiful web of life we are only one we are only but one species of countless ones who call this planet their only home we don't have the right to claim everything there's a movement called the 50 percent uh, for the earth giving back to nature rewilding and you know we have to shrink our human enterprise big time well, and, how do you and, suggest yeah, people do that? Many people in the alternative scene try to do it their way. For example, going local is a very important move away from the whole uh, globalized trade system. You know, we don't have to catch tuna on our coast and send it to China to be processed and then back to another continent. Some things go around a triangle, food miles. It's incredibly stupid only works with cheap energy. This system is now falling apart, not only because of the Ukraine war. And um, so, but there's only, there's a certain limit here. Yeah? I, I mean, how much we dare to fly or drive a car or we can do all these things. It's personal lifestyle choices. And there's a big movement towards that. And that's fantastic. But we still have to see that the big systemic change can only come from governments and the big corporations. And we have to keep pressurizing them to make these changes and the banking sector. But there is a lot of change of thought, too. But uh, it's all you, even the UN, which is one of my big hopes. And yet it is still very anthropocentric in these sustainable development goals. So and even in our, in our circles, and that's my point, when we talk about have a weekend with trees, right? So we invite people to come and, again, take from trees what you can, which is in the way that same colonialistic attitude. We come and take and then we go home again. So my point about trees on anything you engage with nature, whether you work with dolphins or butterflies or bees or animals, is give back. What can I give back? Because mm -hmm. I'm not the first, first most important uh, being, and not me as singul singular and not our species either. So how can we start to truly engage again on, on a more at par level? with every other being. And that's also how I meet a tree. I have all this knowledge but about history, trees and botany and so on. But when I meet a tree, I'm open. I forget all that. It's like when I meet you, I want to know who are you, Ratika? I'm not saying oh, you're 98% water and I know the rest. Bye. You know, I'm actually opening my heart and my mind and see who am I meeting here. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And Dima, would you like to add anything? I'd like to share from my own experience, really, because I was on this journey for quite a while, and we even started the eco community, and then we also started the hemp and cooperative, which is the uh, one of the biggest hemp growers in in the UK for for some time, um, and that was intention to make that change to to bring that kind of positive impact into the environment or change change that attitude what can we grow to support carbon sequestrations but the thing what i came to at some point that is you can try to change the industries but actually 
until it's changed something within the heart, it's it doesn't make no sense because like I'll give you the example a person would would uh, you know use the plastic or something and you create some kind of change of plastic you change that industry so he doesn't use that but he's gonna turn his head elsewhere and gonna you know chop the tree or something like that which is like just gonna continue that kind of journey or ignorance that could be there until it clicks something within us right one by one and this is for me was so powerful to understand to realize it that i actually give up some of my work at at uh, cooperative and passed it on and starts uh, working directly with those practices which can unlock this uh, intrinsic powers within us or intrinsic wisdom within us which which can guide us which is nobody else can tell us it's only until we understand for ourselves uh, where our ego is and where our actually a true self is that understanding of us being like a cell in our organism right so there's a if the organ in the organism is is well and it's supported by others, all organism is doing well, right? But if that organ thinks that it's only me, you know, only, and I'm going to be doing well, I'm a stomach, for example, mm-hmm. let me have more, 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 and, but without elimination forces, right? You're just going to uh, explode, so everyone's going to die. So mm-hmm. I think this is understanding, and you can also relate this to, to that tree idea, right? I think this is something is to be realized by by people, by each of us. And this is how we can contribute, is actually going to the journeys, using those tools available to us, like yoga tools, meditation tools, which can actually bring that experiential understanding. Because if someone told me like this, you know, I say, well, yeah, thank you very much. And I'm going to go and get my another burger, right? Uh, when I'm hungry, when the pressure is on me. But actually, when you understand this, when something clicked, when you when you understood you're part of this organism, part of this nature, then it's something going to stay within you. And then you influence your family, they're going to see you, your friends, going to also see you and that's how you make a real change this is a real revolution i think starting mm-hmm. from yourself and then helping others to understand that who around you who around you and that's the the most sustainable way i think to go forth mm. and one thing i loved about the retreat that i went to last year is that everyone you encourage that sustainable living um with a simple action like we de- putting your food compost in the compost bin and eating well we ate plant based food which i loved um and also like we didn't use much electricity when we were camping right uh you literally ad- your clock works with um the sun <laughs> the yeah. circadian rhythm this is actually another thing which is remind me one of the very amazing solutions is to put our own waste into compost you know all that uh, compost toilets for example i worked as well for the natural event company which is doing now all toilets in some sustainable festivals and this is something we take from the land right and then even when we waste our biological waste even that we don't put back even that we put like some chemicals and we just flush it somewhere but actually just by putting our own biological waste back into the system we put it also into the cycle the natural cycle so even that solution it's already massive we can, if we can encourage this uh, within everybody that's is already a massive because this way we communicate to nature we give the nutrients but we also communicate information about ourselves and this is when we give that information to nature it it give us what we need as well it give us those nutrients it give us those you know elements and the minerals which which we need when you know you you transmit in a way that information that makes so, sense and that's one of the hardest things i found after the retreat coming back to london is trying to integrate th- the way of living in a city life <laughs> which is so i find it so difficult i mean i okay i walked around 
Harrods the other day, for example, and there's no place to refill your water bottle. Absolutely no place to refill that. And I thought they really want me to buy water. So I asked them, can you please refill my water bottle? And then the lady said, you know, all toilets in Harrods are filtered. And I thought the, all the water that comes from the toilet tap are filtered. But no one, I just went to the toilet, refilled my bottle after they refilled at the bar. But I thought, I mean, this is, <laughs> you know, a really um, poor practice. <laughs> That water that we all consume has to, you can't even refill your own bottle. So that that's I had to go out of my way to to do that. But yeah, so Yannick, we were talking about welcome back in a we're in a critical point in Mother Nature and what advice would you give people to shift to make a shift in their being? And do you have anything to add to that point? Uh yes, I do. Um I haven't heard everything that everyone else said. I'm glad I managed to come back on. Um, so I think how I see um, change is often, it's not the majority of people that all decide together to do something differently. It's often like a little subculture or a little area of pioneering that will start off a trend and then eventually reach into the mainstream. Uh, like yoga itself, for example, 40 years ago, it was this kind of rare, exotic kind of thing that a few people do and now every little village has got two different yoga classes and I think there's a trend with um, permaculture and like conscious festival culture as well where we come together we take care of um, our waste we reduce waste we have uh, solar powered electricity and all of those things and we're kind of like trying something out on a small scale that I think when the time comes when the majority of people is willing to uh, try out new ways, maybe out of necessity, that then those practices that have been in place for 20, 30 years, but that are ignored because it's more convenient to stick to maybe bigger, um, more established kind of production chains, for example, that at some point those like subcultural trends can then like burst and emerge into the mainstream in beautiful ways. Mm. And I believe that making it fun is one of the crucial points. So yeah. no one wants to be forced out of bed in the morning to plant 20 trees. <laughs> but if we have, uh, let's say, a festival where we're not just using a campsite, but we're choosing a campsite to transform half of it into, um, into reforestation uh, forest project. And then I envisioned you have a, a dance floor and right next to that there will be people planting trees. So we just, we can make it a party and I believe we can have a really good time um, bringing in change. And it doesn't have to be this kind of dreadful, oh no, things are changing and it's going to be terrible. But we can actually tune in to our adaptability and our human creativity and um, yeah, have a revolution, but with a good sound system and yeah. good food and yeah. children and animals and to get into that kind of festival culture that I believe is um, very potent and, and part, definitely part of my life where I like to bring my workshop offerings, my artwork uh, every summer. And yeah, I believe in that power of healthy subculture that anchors uh, new yeah. ways of doing things. And that's one of the things I um, liked about the retreat is we're dancing around a fire and I felt mm. so tribal and so like, um, how do I say it? Like, almost like I was in the middle of the forest, you know, being <laughs> back in, in the middle of nowhere and very connected to just the pure raw elements. The wild woman in me came out at the retreat. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe just one more sentence I really like that um, quote from David Attenborough where he says people will only protect what they understand and they will only understand what they love so mm -hmm. by creating relationship and understanding that's what sparks of our willingness to protect something because if we're disconnected and we don't know or we don't, we don't feel then where can that yeah. motivation to change can only be imposed on people and we all no one likes to have something imposed on us so like building relationship like we're going to do during the retreat for me that directly links in with like practical steps that can then come from that deepened love and understanding of 
not just the mm -hmm. trees, but each other as well. Yes. Um, Nima, do you have anything to add? Something came up to me is uh, to go wider you know how important those uh, remembrance your own remembrance and probably understanding even the aspects of the reincarnation uh, because when we like remember our previous lives so we remember ourselves and we also also understanding the laws of karma as well what you do that what is going to come back to you and this kind of stuff is it it can change the world i think this is when, when you experience it or when you understand the reincarnation particularly and the karmic law then there is there is less chance we we're gonna uh, do harm to to our nature and to uh, people around us so from from that perspective this kind of your work on your self-development path can really facilitate lots of change. Mm. Fred, do you have anything to say about that? I 100% agree. I couldn't say anything better than Yannick and Dima have just done so. And I like that point that what you love, you protect. So Yannick, what advice would you give someone who's not around trees? For example, in the city here at work, it's hard to have the luxury of tree around you all the time or when you need it the most um, how would one connect to a tree for me our inner world is a reflection of the outer world and i personally i work with an inner forest that i um, have been uh, dreaming up in my inner world over many years and even if i'm let's say i'm in a place that feels um, artificial I can draw on strength from my inner sanctuary that I've been cultivating. But then if people are in a city, a lot of the time, I used to live in Berlin for four years, which um, has many trees, but still I would go out on weekends and just make sure I leave the city every now and then. Because the whole concept of a city in itself is not a very sustainable um, model of living. It's only possible because of uh, very intense ways of farming and agriculture so just mm -hmm. to reconnect with the countryside every now and then even if it's just a couple of times a year to go out to come let's say to Hardwick Estate and just immerse yourself in those experiences and then like treasure some of the experiences that you had to make sure that you can draw on them just on calling on them on the inside so um, because of doing that work for a while now I can call on some of my tree allies in situations where there's no trees around me mm. but it still takes a certain it's not like an instant thing it takes time to establish a relationship and what we offer is we introduce people to our ways of doing things to to the trees to the land and also for people who already have their connections i think it's often also a good starting point to acknowledge maybe it's like a childhood memory of building a tree house or being on holiday somewhere mm -hmm. those precious moments can be like sources of, of strength as well um, and Fred you have something interesting where you look at the vibrations of the trees and transmute that into music can you please talk to us about connecting through that ah well yeah it's it's not so much the vibrations uh, let me blend in with what Yannick just said. It's quite like that for me too. I have this inner sacred grove and when I see one of the tree manifestations out there and it's like I see old friends all the time. So I, I can, ex and it doesn't need even to go there and spend much time with it. I, I can be in a driving car or on a train and I see the trees go by and I go, yes, alder and birch and oak and it just, it's, the world is so full of good friends because they are our friends. And once you have the connection, it's there. It's like, you know, how do you connect with your loved one or your parents or your children? You just think, I think something is wrong with mom. I better give her a ring. And your intuition may be proved right. And she, whatever, had a little problem there. So it's just, yeah, you establish a connection and then you are connected with the wood wide web. <laughs> Mm. And regarding my music, thank you. I, along the lines of all what we've said, is um, 
we are creating a new culture by doing what we love and interacting and connecting with what we love and what is good in life and good for life. And being a musician, I just took my inspiration um, towards or from um, the trees. Again, also in an in a attempt to give back to them because obviously you don't make tree music for trees. They don't... I mean, they don't listen to CDs or downloads, but you do it for humans to tell humans, hey, there's so much about uh, this or that tree species. And we come to love living things as, as soon as we get to hear something about them. That's why, like David Attenborough's life has been so important. You know? Once you know what polar bears do, or there has been on Netflix this octopus teacher documentary, and it changed the world in terms of octopuses, because now we're, oh my God, so intelligent, so sensitive, these little creatures. And then you you cannot but love them. You know, it's just, bunnies have maybe more cuteness to them, but so everything's so lovable. So... Uh, but I didn't translate tree vibrations as such. I just followed my heart in what's coming to uh, from the tree and what I want to give back. And then also bring in some elements from, from the character and the history. Say birch in its all its female rather grace and flexibility, dancing in the wind, eternally youthful, is, uh, you know, creates a different piece of joyful dancing music mm -hmm. compared with the somber yew tree which may be absolutely ancient yews are the oldest trees here in our part of the world or can be and they stand solid and don't move and they don't bash an eyelid they just stand there like a rock of eternity so mm -hmm. that will create a different music again nice and uh Dima, do you have anything to add on how one should connect with a tree when they're not quite next to a tree or in an environment where it's not feasible? Yeah, I think, again, I'll speak from experience. I think I began the journey uh, on, a, on a Vipassana and there was a meditation. Uh, it, it was a different style of Vipassana. You probably imagine the Gainka Vipassana, if people know, but that's a um, different one in, 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 in Russia. There was one of the meditation where you imagine the tree behind you and you then imagine uh, yourself sitting there. So you're kind of trying to, the idea of the meditation, you're trying to tap in into the deeper memories of your reincarnations and perhaps already experienced that tree behind you. I went to this journey quite deep with this meditation. And I think before that, I haven't really used the tree so much for, for this reason. And then since then, when I came back, there was a completely different relationship. So what I'm trying to say here, that, that actually a tree itself, it doesn't need to be there. Uh, it, you can begin without it. Your visualization is so powerful. Uh, our mind, when we visualize something, uh, our mind doesn't really understand if it happens real or not. So the mm -hmm. senses, you know, we, uh, the visualization can be a powerful tool. So you, you can work uh, with the trees even without it mm -hmm. in reality. And then if you do that, in fact, your future experiences will be much more profound because you develop that sensitivity without actually a thing there. Can you imagine? Mm -hmm. You become so powerful. So then afterwards, when, when you bring that thing behind you, that kind of movement of the energy, then you might going to fly. Who knows? <laughs> so. <laughs> Thank you. Um, now, can you, uh, Dima, the, can you please share with us more about this retreat they're offering and this immersive experience? And is previous knowledge, do they need to do anything to get a lot out of this retreat? No, I think this is was the, the idea was to bring the knowledgeable people, to bring people who have that connection and actually beyond the words. And that was the idea was to bring Fred and Yannick so we can we can just uh, you know come together and share our 
our practices around that and actually try it out. So you don't need to have the uh, much experience, really. We we're all going to be learning from each other, and we're just there to to facilitate that comfortable journey with the wonderful food, you know, with the yeah. uh, immersed in in the wild nature. How it's supposed to be? There's a wonderful forest there for us to to go and. In, enjoy the tit quietude and there are also this massive oaks around where we'll where we'll go ahead on this meditation which i'm going to be sharing with you which brought me to it myself and also we have some experience from the other retreat one of the person actually she came to me and said that she she tapped into her previous lives with that meditation from first go, can you imagine? And we even made an interview with her. You can you can find out, and it's in Sathama channel. So you don't need to have much experience. You just uh, go and you know immerse see yourself. how it goes. Yeah, immerse immerse yourself. So there 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 will be a music element to it if you don't feel like you're ready for the full-on meditation in your so there's a different ways you can interact through the music for example uh, or through just be being with a group or just walking in a forest and foraging and stuff like that so something more accessible for you so we develop it the, the way that the uh, people with different uh, practice level can also enjoy it uh, Yannick, do you have anything to add? Well, something that I feel excited about with the upcoming retreat is that um, I believe that magic happens when we are in the right place at the right time. And so for this retreat, we have a beautiful venue with ancient trees and it's a time of Beltane. So that in itself mm -hmm. is a very potent combination. And um, in a way, we're going to be working together as a team I have never come across a re retreat or weekend offering with this kind of blend of um, different elements that we're going to be weaving in. So uh, I myself don't know exactly how it's going to unfold, but I believe that being in the right place in the right time with the skill sets and, uh, and um, experiences that we bring, that we're all kind of spiral together into something unique and beautiful and um, yeah just trust that the right people will be there yeah and Fred I'm just looking forward to meet you guys here on the screen and everyone who watching this um, to meet you in real life under the trees from personal experience of being in the Hardwick Estate and the magic that is cultivated on that land, um, it truly gave me a boost of energy to come back to London and continue my activity and to continue to spread my light in a place which also can be seen as such a black hole of energy consumption. They use hmm. so much energy here. <laughs> Blows my mind. <laughs> So to try and incorporate that into my practices. And now recently, you know, even trying to cycling now here and there to to bring in that eco element mm -hmm. to my life. Yeah. Um, and uh, Dima, anything else? Uh, would, was there anything else any, anyone would like to add? Um, a, a meditation, I think you were saying, Dima, that you wanted to share? Um, I think meditation we can uh, share on the retreat probably. Mm -hmm. I think the, what, what I could could add is that you're hearing this knowledge for a reason, and if uh, if people are there and and they just you know discover this and they listen this uh, to the end of it, so there is a reason there behind it. So you you met us all who all have the connection, like a deeper connection to the trees tree spirit and uh, so perhaps take the opportunity today go and sit under and uh, speak with the tree and then you know meditate under see if you be able to tap into that connection because because the information never comes just for for no reason so i think it's just to honor that uh, uh, why is it come and just you know, do something about it. So that might be something which can turn your 
life into something completely beautiful like it was for me um, after sitting in an oak for some time uh, for three days i think you sat in an oak tree for three days shit. yeah that's right there was there was a, uh so you don't have to go to that extreme but like yeah. um my life changed around uh, so there was like a different aspect of my realization came came through and trajectory of what i do actually also changed quite dramatically and it was amazing experience so you know following up and then actually putting it into practice can can really trigger something beautiful and if you're able to join in and just come next week it's next weekend uh it's only you know 40 minutes from london you can just jump in and come and even for a day like people can just drop in for the day then leave at night they don't have to stay overnight there that's right there are options to to come for a day you can also get the airbnb if you don't want to camp or you can um you know fully immersed with us and and you know it's all depending on your uh capacity and uh, your condition and even just enjoy the delicious food that Karen is orchestrating for everyone. <laughs> oh, I'm looking forward to it. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm sometimes I'm, I'm imagining the retreat and I remember the last ones and I say to myself this is something to look forward to. <laughs> yeah. On, yeah. On, to, on top of all of that cuz you know it's it's about 3 days where you don't have to cook or anything. You just yeah. like go and tap into every meal like three three times a day and, and then also hot drinks as well brought yeah. to you. So all of that kind of uh luxury is is actually it's quite intrinsic to good deep spiritual experience because you know when you take off the domestic side so you can fully concentrate and this was actually recommended when you go to your own retreat try to get that domestics out of the way so you don't have to think how to cook what to cook so it's all take care and then and then so you can fully concentrate on your mm -hmm. development so this is very valuable mm -hmm. or if you do want to cook i believe karen can teach you how to cook for your dosha which we did a session if that's what you're interested in learning how to cook as well she can cater for that any could you like to add anything i just want to say thank you for everyone who's joined and listened in and uh yeah we could have gone on for much longer i feel uh, it's such a rich and interesting um topic we should just scratch the surface and uh yeah i look forward to going deeper with people in person in an embodied way incorporating movement sound stillness and all of those um yeah important aspects that uh so thank you and thank you to you as well and to Fred and Dima you're welcome and that social connection that you can build on this uh retreat and uh especially after post pandemic and friend would you like to add anything As I said I look forward to everyone and I just sort of something came to my mind I don't know why I'm surprising myself with uh, before I go out I have to go with a quote from the Bible in John's revelation who said uh, and the leaves of the tree shall be for the healing of the nations mm. so goodbye everyone and mm -hmm. see you soon Thank you so much. Really pleasure to have you guys and please go to the retreat if you have the opportunity or the means to I highly recommend it. It's a beautiful place and you will enjoy it whichever way you need to and give back as well. So have a beautiful day and happy Earth Day. What an auspicious day to hold this conversation. Uh, so to share the importance of mother nature not only today but also every day but to bring that to the forefront of our minds today <laughs> thank you all for listening and joining L much love happy earth day bye bye, bye.